Oh God, come to my aid. Oh Lord, hasten to help me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now, and evermore, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Alleluia. May God have compassion on us and bless us. May he manifest his presence to us and have mercy on us, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples give thanks to you, O God. Let all the peoples confess and praise you. Let the nations be glad and rejoice, because you will judge the people with justice and you will guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples give thanks to you, O God. Let all the peoples confess and praise you. The earth has given her fruit. May God, our God, bless us. May God bless us, and may all the ends of the earth fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now, and evermore, and to the ages of ages. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord will build up Zion, and he will be seen in his glory. The Lord will build up Zion, and he will be seen in his glory. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with exultation. Know that the Lord himself is our God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with song. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is eternal, and his truth continues from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now, and evermore, and to the ages of ages. Amen. The Lord will build up Zion, and he will be seen in his glory. I shall not die but live, and I will tell of the works of the Lord. I shall not die but live, and I will tell of the works of the Lord. O God, my God, at dawn I rise to you. My soul thirsts for you, and how often my flesh longs for you. In a desolate land, trackless and waterless, so I appeared before you in the holy place, to see your power and your glory, for your love is better than life. My lips shall praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live, and lift up my hands in your name. Let my soul be filled with delight, and my mouth will praise you with joyfulness when I remember you on my bed. I meditate on you in the morning watches, for you have
become my helper. And in the shelter of your wings I rejoice. My soul is good behind you. And your right hand holds me tightly. But those trying in vain to take my life will go into earth's infernal regions. They will be delivered to the hands of the sword. They will be the portion of jackals, but the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by him will be praised. For the mouth of those who tell lies will be stopped. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now, and evermore, and to the ages of ages. Amen. I shall not die, but live. And I will tell of the works of the Lord. Lord, if you will, you can make me free. And Jesus said, it is my will be healed. <clears throat> Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, it is my will be healed. Christ rose from the dead, the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep. Architect of the universe, in himself he has renewed the corrupt nature of the human race. O oh, death, it is no longer you who reign. Because the master of the universe has destroyed your empire. In your flesh, O Lord, you have tasted death. By your resurrection, you have removed its bitterness. From this time forth, you have strengthened humankind against it. You have abolished the ancient curse that crushed us. O protector of our life, glory to you. Your immutable divinity and your voluntary passion, O Lord, have struck Hades with astonishment, and the house of the dead in mourning cries aloud. I tremble when I see before me this body which remains without corruption. I behold the invisible one who mystically wages war on me. And those whom I hold captive exclaim, Glory to your resurrection, O Christ. Your crucifixion, none can comprehend it. Your resurrection, none can explain it. We, the faithful, exalt this ineffable mystery. Today, death and Hades have been stripped away. The human race has been clothed with incorruptible might. Therefore, in our thanksgiving, we sing to you. Glory to your resurrection, O Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now, and evermore, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, it is my will be healed. Oh. 
for people drawing near to him. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let his praise be sung in the church of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him who made him. And let the children of Zion exult in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing to him with drum and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. And will exalt the meek with his salvation. The saints will exalt in glory. And they will rejoice on their beds. The high praises of God will be in their throats. And two-edged swords in their hands to pass judgment on the nations and give rebukes among the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to pass judgment on them as God has written. This glory will be for all his saints. Praise God in his saints. Praise him in the expanse of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his infinite greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with psaltery and harp. Praise him with drums and dancing. Praise him with strings and bells. Praise him with well-tuned cymbals. Praise him with symbols of victory. Let every breath praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning and now and evermore. And to the ages of ages. Amen. Your resurrection, O Christ, hallelujah, brings joy to the heavens and the earth, hallelujah, hallelujah. A reading from the epistle of the holy apostle Paul to the Romans. Brethren, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. We pay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all people. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thanks be to God. The Lord is King, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. With power he has surrounded himself. The Lord is King, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. With power he has surrounded himself. Holiness adorns 
fills your house, O Lord, forevermore. The Lord is King, he is robed in majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength, with power he has surrounded himself. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord is King, he is robed in majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength, with power he has surrounded himself. O Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, when Jesus came down from the mountains, large crowds followed him. Then a leper came to him, bowed down and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, it is my will, be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, See that you do not tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priests, and as evidence to them, offer the gift that Moses ordered. Now as he was entering Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying in the house paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not important enough that you should come under my roof but only speak, and by your word my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he was filled with admiration and said to those who were following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found such faith as this in Israel. But I tell you, many will come from the east and from the west and will decline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and chattering of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, and as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed in that hour. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. When I was a teenager, I first saw and enjoyed the film The Englishman Who Went Up a Hill But Came Down the Mountain. It's still occasionally screened on television and is probably one of the few films starring Hugh Grant that doesn't send me desperately scrabbling for the remote control. I won't bore you with the full details of the plot line now, but what's important for you to know is that the residents of a small Welsh village took great pride in their local mountain 
and were horrified to learn that, due to erosion, it had lost heights and was, down, it was due to be downgraded to the status of a mere hill. The film is about the lengths they were willing to go to in order to ensure it retained its status as a mountain. Having a mountain was clearly very important to them. Interesting things happen on mountains. As the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And elsewhere, I am appointed king by him on Zion, his holy mountain. And also, O Lord, who will live in your temple? Or who will settle on your holy mountain? One whose way of life is blameless and who does what is right, who speaks the truth in his heart. The holy prophet and King David here intimates that mountains are the place of encounter with the holiness of God. And this is echoed in various parts of Holy Scripture. In Genesis, in chapter 3, Moses ascends Mount Horeb and there encounters the divine Son, revealed to him in the bush, which was engulfed in flames, but which was not consumed. The voice of the pre-incarnate Son commanded Moses to remove his shoes, for the place where he was standing was holy ground, and it is here that he revealed to Moses his unspeakable name, I Am, the very I Am which Jesus Christ identified himself to be one of the same with in the Gospels. For this reason in the New Testament Church, we understand the burning bush as a type, a prefiguring of Mary, the most holy mother of God. For, like the bush, she contained within herself the uncontainable presence of God the Son, and yet she was not destroyed. Moses then came down from that mountain encounter with God, with a mission, to lead God's chosen people from slavery in Egypt into freedom in the promised land. And long after their escape from the Pharaoh and their salvation through the waters of the Red Sea, we again see Moses ascending to the mountain, this time Mount Sinai, and there God reveals to him his will. And again, Moses descends from the mountain with a message from God, this time in the form of the Ten Commandments, by which God's people are to model their lives according to his will. Of course, the Transfiguration also happened on a mountain, Mount Tabor, and it's from the Mount of Olives that Jesus ascended into heaven at the end of his time on earth. Now in today's Gospel, we hear the story of what happened in the immediate aftermath of the famous Sermon on the Mount, the sermon in which the Saviour gives us the Beatitudes, teaches us the Our Father, which is the basis of all Christian prayer, and is the same mountain sermon from which we receive various well-known pearls of wisdom that have come down to us. You might recognise some of them. You cannot serve God and mammon. Judge not that you be not judged. Do not cast your pearls before swine. After having imparted these divine teachings, the Saviour descends from the mountain, revealing his power in the form of the healing of the leper. A little while later, he declares the beloved servant of the centurion to be healed without even being in the presence of the man. So what do these two healings have in common? The Saviour was approached by people of strong faith who asked this of him. The leper declares his knowledge that if it is the Saviour's will, it can be done. And the centurion, a Roman citizen and not a Jew, declares his own unworthiness while stating that he knows that the Saviour's word on its own has power to heal. He says, Lord, I am not important enough that you should come under my roof, but only speak and by your word my servants will be healed. These are the first healing miracles of the Lord, and now reveal his power not just over the elements, changing water into wine, but over the effects of the fall on humankind. These miracles should increase our own faith and fill us with awe when we read the Gospels, for they point us to the resurrection and Christ's conquering of our death. They speak of union with God and how this theosis, this growth into the life of God, 
means the fallenness of our lives is obliterated as we draw closer and closer to him. However, we cannot pretend that they do not also raise some very uncomfortable questions, questions which cause difficulty for many Christians and which many atheists give as part of the reason for their unbelief. I'm talking about what theologians call the problem of evil, evil in theological terms referring to anything that is contrary to God's will for his creation, and as well as the willful actions of people includes things like natural disasters and sickness and suffering. The problem goes something like this. If God is all loving as we believe, then he desires to stop evil and suffering. If he is all powerful as we believe, then he is capable of stopping evil and suffering. Yet, despite this all powerful, all loving God, evil and suffering still exist. So, how are we to understand this? Stephen Fry, whom I admire in many ways, but whose tendency to insert anti Christian rhetoric at every opportunity uh, grates on me a little, once famously declared that, should God exist, he would want to confront him face to face for either causing or allowing such pain and suffering to human beings. Those of us who are of the household of Christ know from our own relationship with God that the ways in which he relates to his creation are often beyond our grasp. As one popular hymn goes, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. The danger here is that too often this becomes a politicised debate or a heated argument among friends, with each side trying to find religious or scientific proof texts to discredit the other side and show themselves to be right. What gets lost in all of this fiery heat is that for many people these are not matters of political debate or egotistical point scoring but are very real questions that they grapple with on a regular basis. People who are bereaved, people who are living with sickness, who are watching loved ones die slowly, or who have had horrific things done to them by other people. People who have lost faith or who are trying to find meaning for their lives. It's easy to dismiss the Stephen Fry's of this world as bitter atheists, and it's easy to dismiss the explanation that God's ways are unknown to us as a cop-out used to avoid difficult questions. However, I don't think either approach will do. I am no theological scholar, but I know enough to know that there has been much ink spilt over the years by more grounded Christians than I, by the fathers of the church, in seeking to shine light on this dilemma, this problem of evil. These attempts are known as theodicies, and make for interesting personal study for anybody interested in learning more. But for those of us within the household of God, we know the statement that God is mysterious to be the truth. This is not some soundbite that we take out of the cupboard and dust off when we have to defend an awkward element of our faith to critics, but rather it's the entire foundation of our faith. It permeates every aspect of how we relate to God day by day. In his essence, God is completely unknowable. We cannot know God, for we are flesh and he is spirit. We cannot see God, or hear God, or imagine God, or perceive him in any way other than what he reveals to himself to us, in ways that we call his energies, the ways in which he chooses to interact with his creation in apparitions in burning bushes, with angels bearing divine messages, in his holy incarnation at Bethlehem, and in the life of the church and the holy sacraments by which we can physically touch him, sacraments which are also called mysteries for a reason. I do not understand on an intellectual level how God became human. I do not comprehend how God has brought me through some of the things that I have experienced in my life. I don't know how God transformed the nature of my being when I was immersed in water. I only know that this is what he has promised us, and that he has given us the means whereby it can be done, and that when I have called out to him, he has answered my prayers, although not always in ways that were immediately apparent to me. 
At the heart of the Christian life is the Eucharist, in which we receive within our own bodies the body and blood of Christ. And during the Mass, when the priest asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit to consecrate the bread and wine, transforming them into the body and blood of the Saviour, he states that this is done through the incomprehensible power of the Holy Spirit. That is to say, we do not understand how it happens, and it would be futile for us to examine this in any kind of scientific way. We only know that it is Christ's promise to us that it does happen, and if God's mysterious ways apply to the most wonderful things in life, then it makes no sense suddenly to abandon this explanation when it comes to some of the more challenging things that happen to people as well. Good or bad, it is all part of our lived experience in this earthly life, and the same rules apply. As for why some people believe and others do not, I cannot answer. I have a secular job, and I rub up against people every day in the world, some of whom have become friends, and sometimes we talk about these things. All I can say is that people who have faith seem to have no one thing in common, and people who do not believe also have no one thing in common, and sometimes people who believe seem to have more in common with people who do not believe than they have with their co-religionists, and vice versa. A friend once confided in me that he doesn't understand my Christianity because he has always respected me as an intelligent person. He had spent his life in a mutually affirming atheist circle of friends and had theorised a neat and tidy view in which Christians are unintelligent people and that if only they would be enlightened, they would abandon all that nonsense. Then he became friends with a Christian and his theory was turned on its head. There's no easy way to tell who will embrace faith and who will not. I can only tell you what I know to be true, which is that over the last 37 years, God has blessed me with my share of mountaintop moments, some of which are intensely personal and which I may never share with others unless the moment calls for it. But I know from these mountaintop moments that God is and that he loves his creation and that he has inscribed his name on my heart. So when we find ourselves facing accusations that there are no miracles anymore, when we have our own moments of doubt, when the will of God is not immediately apparent to us, and it seems that what we think is our most desperate need is not granted to us, for reasons that we do not understand, let us remember the faith of the centurion that he had in God to provide what he knew to be necessary, and let us come before Christ with the words that we say at every Mass, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Thanks be to God.
heavens, and by the gifts their God confessed. The Lamb of God is manifest, again in Jordan's water blessed. And he who sin had never known, by washing half our sins undone. Yet he that ruleth everything can change the nature of the sin and gives at Cana this for sign the water reddens into wine. Then glory, Lord, to thee we pay for thy epiphany today. O glory through eternity to Father, Son, and Spirit be. Bishop Gregory, for Bishop Golas and Bishop Jonah, for 
the bishops of our sister churches, Martin, Mark, Paul, Joan, Gabriel, and Gregory, for all bishops, priests, and deacons, for the clergy and all the faithful, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison. For this church, this town, and our neighboring cities, and all who live here, for our country and all who govern it, especially for the handmaid of God, our sovereign lady Elizabeth, and all her royal house, her government and her prime minister Boris, that God may grant them wisdom, so that we may live in peace and tranquility. Let us pray to the Lord. For all in civil authority, for monks, nuns and virgins, for husbands, wives and children, for single persons, widows and orphans, and for all who toil and labour, let us pray to the Lord. For seasonable weather, the fertility of the fields, the abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for wholesome air, herb, water, and space, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison. For penitents and catechumens, in particular for the servant of God Bertram and the handmaid of God Maria, for those who search for God but cannot yet name him, and for those who do not seek him, or who resist his grace, let us pray to the Lord. For those who confess the blessed name of Christ, for those who are persecuted and for their persecutors, for those who travel and for their safe return, for the sick, and in particular for the servants and handmaids of God, Melanga, Thomas, the nun Theologia, Dimitri, the Presbytera Helena, the priest Gabriel, Jennifer, the abbot Demetrius, Derek, Igor, Elizabeth, Abby, Seto, Paul, the Presbytera Mary, the priest Alden, Laura, Peter, Eileen, and for those who are tormented by sadness, anguish, loneliness, or impure spirits, let us pray to the Lord. For those who commit injustice against their neighbours, whether by causing sorrow to orphans and families, or by spilling innocent blood, or by returning hatred for hatred, that God would grant them repentance, enlighten their minds and their hearts, and fill their souls with the light of love, even towards their enemies. Let us pray to the Lord. That the Lord would grant us courage and wisdom, that we may act with prudence, and that we may bring about the ordering of our church in a manner well-pleasing to him, let us pray to the Lord. For our departed mothers, fathers, sisters and brothers, and in particular for the servants and handmaids of God, the deacon Maxime, the priest Thierry, the archbishop Vigil, the Presbytera Rachel, the priest Alphonse, Regina, Morris, Edith, Harold, Stella, Patrick, the nun Christiane, and the newly departed handmaid of God Julie, and the newly departed servants of God Roger, and all who are here and everywhere laid to rest, let us pray to the Lord. For those who sing, serve, and distribute their goods by works of mercy in the Holy Church, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie 
May the Lord fill us with his grace through the prayers of our Lady, the Mother, Michael and all the heavenly hosts of apostles, martyrs and confessors of Saint Melanga, the poet, the patroness of our church, of the holy Merbedas, and of Saint Timothy, Saint Cavac of Clancarden, Saint Manark of Le Monaghan, and Saint Guasat of Granard, whose memorial we keep today, and of all the saints. Grant this, O Lord. May the Lord grant us pardon of our sins and a Christian and peaceful ending to our lives. Grant this, O Lord. May the Lord preserve us in the purity of the faith and in the bonds of perfect charity. Grant this, O Lord. Let us say with all our hearts and with all our spirit, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. Give us today our super substantial bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Save us from falling into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For to you belong the kingdom and the power and the glory to the ages of ages. Amen. O Lord our God, who do not desire the death of sinners, but that they should return to you and live, Purify us from the leprosy of our sins, and grant us the grace of faith, that it may cultivate within us an interior prayerfulness, and that we may feast at the banquet of the kingdom, in the glory of the thrice holy God, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. O Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. May the Lord, who rose from the dead, at the prayers of the most holy, pure, immaculate Mother of God and ever Virgin Mary, of Saint Melangas of Paris, of the Holy Merberus, and of Saint Timothy, Saint Cada, Saint Mana, and Saint Guasat, whose memorial we keep today, and of all the saints, grant us his peace and eternal life. Amen. Gracious Mother of our Redeemer, enduring forever, gate of heaven and star of the sea, give aid to your people, who though falling strive to rise again. O maiden who gave birth to your holy creator, to the wonder of all nature. 